And hello from the campus of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We welcome you to the Software Engineering Institute's webinar series. Our presentation today is Advancing Cyber Intelligence Practices through the SEI's Consortium. Depending on your location, we wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Shane McGraw, your moderator for today, and I'd like to thank you for attending. We want to make today as interactive as possible, so we will address questions throughout the presentation and again at the end of the presentation. To log a question, simply go to the Q&A tab on your event console and type in your click question and click send. We will also ask a few polling questions throughout the presentation and they will appear as a pop-up window on your screen. The first question we want to ask today is how did you hear about today's event? Another three tabs I'd like to point out are the files, Twitter, and survey tabs. The survey we ask that you fill out upon completion of the webinar as your feedback is always greatly appreciated. The files tab has a PDF copy of the presentation slides there now, along with other work in cyber intelligence from the SEI. For those of you using Twitter, be sure to follow at SEI News and use the hashtag SEI Cyber. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Jay McAllister leads research and development efforts that provide technical solutions and analytical acumen to cyber intelligence practitioners from government, industry, and academia. Prior to joining the SEI, Jay serves as a counterintelligence and counterterrorism analyst for the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. He holds a master's degree in strategic intelligence from the National Intelligence University and a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Notre Dame. Melissa Kassan Ludwig is a technical analyst for the SEI's Emerging Technology Center. In this role, she focuses on matching state-of-the-art software research with critical government and private sector needs. Ludwig is currently concentrating on research and prototyping efforts aimed at developing and refining cyber intelligence methodologies, technologies, and processes. And now I'd like to turn it over to Jay McAllister. Jay, all yours. Welcome. Thanks, Shane. Welcome, everybody. Today we're going to talk about the cyber intelligence work we're doing here at the SEI's Emerging Technology Center. We've been looking at cyber intelligence for about the past three years, and we wanted to talk to you about uh, a lot of the research that we've been doing in that space uh, to include mostly a consortium that we're currently running called the Cyber Intelligence Research Consortium. Three big things we want to talk about today, and those include the consortium, its purpose, origins, and then the offerings. And then what are we actually doing? What does it mean to do research and development R&D within the cyber intelligence space? We're going to give you two examples of some of the many things we're working on for our consortium members. Uh, that's going to be talking about evaluating intelligence as well as evaluating analysts. And then we're going to talk about future work, things that we're doing to finish up year one of our consortium and then moving on into year two, year two beginning in July of this year. Hello, we're going to be talking about our Cyber Intelligence Research Consortium, and Jay mentioned that that started this year, this past June, so we're a little bit more than halfway through our first year. The purpose of the consortium, it's a member-funded initiative that researches and develops technical solutions and analytic practices to advance the art and the science of cyber intelligence. Um, so before we go any further, we thought we'd talk a few minutes about our definition of cyber intelligence. There's, there's lots of them floating out there, but we define cyber intelligence as the acquisition and analysis of information. This information is identifying, tracking, and predicting cyber capabilities, uh, intentions, and activities. And most importantly, this information is going to be used in your organization um, to offer courses of action that enhance decision making. So what we mean by information, you're looking at both the technical and the strategic. Um, you're looking within your organization at your technical network data. You're looking at information from your finance department or your strategic development group. And then you're looking external. You're looking at um, kind of what's happening in the news right now, the major cyber threats that are, that are occurring, um, what the president might talk about cyber in his State of the Union address. Um, you're looking at social media, what's happening on Twitter, and what's happening open source, news articles, anything that you would find online. So you're using that technical and strategic information, and you're taking it and applying it to a cyber threat. So our consortium 
was formed because our partners in government, industry, and academia were really looking for three things. Um, access to cost-effective resources for cyber intelligence, um, workforce development, and technology scouting. So our membership, they really work um, in an operational pace very busy, and they um, don't have necessarily the time or the resources to have a research and development function. Um, so they're able to pool their resources together in our consortium and use us as their research and development. Um, so we do this work for them. Our members are also looking for awareness of the analytical practices um, from all organizations. And we say regardless of size or economic sector. So our membership um, kind of have a, a varying range. Uh, they represent multiple sectors, both in government, industry, and academia. But the important thing is they're all taking technical and strategic information, and they're applying it to cyber threats. So regardless of size or economic sector, they're all doing kind of the same function, and there's a lot we can learn from each other there. Um, finally, our membership's looking to the insight and the access that we have here to SEI practitioners and Carnegie Mellon practitioners and their skills and capabilities. Okay. So our origins, we've been working in cyber intelligence for just over three years now. Um, before we get into that, do you want to take a polling question? Yeah, we're going to ask a quick polling question. One of the things Jay and Melissa wanted to do, folks, uh, throughout the webinar was kind of make sure you, you get what you need out of this webinar. So we we're, going to, we're going to ask a couple polling questions throughout uh, to make sure you're getting your, your questions answered and make sure you're understanding what's being posed. The, the first, or actually the second question we want to pose is, would you like more information on our cyber intelligence, de cyber intelligence definition and its relationships with cybersecurity, cyber threat intelligence, et cetera? So if you need more, more of an understanding of what we're talking about by the cyber intelligence, how it refers or relates to cybersecurity, uh, go ahead and, and vote now. And uh, we'll give them about 15 or 20 seconds. We can get into origins, and we'll come back to that in a second, Great. Melissa. So. Great. Thank you. Okay. So we've been working in this space for about three years now. We started with our Cyber Intelligence Tradecraft Project. And this is a project that was sponsored by the Office for the Director of National Intelligence. Um, and we were really looking at the cyber intelligence capabilities through a broad range of organizations. We looked at 30 companies uh, representing government, industry, and academia, and we looked at how they were conducting cyber intelligence in their own organizations. Uh, our, I think our overall most important finding that came out of this is we found that successful organizations that really utilize cyber intelligence um, really balance the need to protect their own network and their network perimeters and um, they balance that with their need to look past them for strategic insights. We had three deliverables coming out of this. Um, the first was our summary of key findings and this is really where we document the work that we did. Um, we take the best practices, common challenges, lessons learned from our, from our 30 organizations. We document it there. Um, we also developed three implementation frameworks, and these are really how-to guides for analysis. Uh, so, like I said, we did three of them. The first one was on threat prioritization, the second one was on collection management, and the third one was on workforce development and management. And finally, our last deliverable for this project was a white paper where we examined the uh, traits, core competencies, and skills of successful cyber intelligence analysts. Um, as a benefit for participating, as a thank you for participating today, um, these deliverables will all be um, uh, downloadable to you. Okay. So if I can show those the results from the survey real quick, we got about 66% looking for more information on what we're calling cyber intelligence. So can we do a little deeper dive into, into that space? Sure thing. Um, I can feel that cyber intelligence, uh, there's a, a whole bunch of different names out there in the space right now. So when we started our research about three years ago, we first uh, went to organizations, whether it was a Fortune 500 company in the financial services sector, the healthcare sector, retail, energy, or it was a federal agency and sat down and said, okay, what do you do for cyber intelligence? Let's start getting into the nitty gritty of, of your processes, your methodologies, your tools, and your training. And they immediately looked at us with a blank stare and said, well, what do you mean by cyber intelligence? So we realized that we had to at least explain what we meant by cyber intel, and that's where we came up with our definition. Um, other phrases, uh, other terms you hear out in this space, cybersecurity, cyber threat intelligence, uh, again, to reiterate what Melissa said, cyber intelligence for us is a, is a strategic, holistic approach to, to assessing or dealing with cyber threats. Um, we look at the strategic aspects. We, looked at, we look at the tactical or the technical, so who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, a lot of organizations, when they talk about cybersecurity, that focuses a lot on more technical analysis and maybe doesn't bring in the strategic 
or at least um, reference the strategic as much as we would like. Uh, when you get a lot of definitions for cyber threat intelligence, a lot of that is indicator sharing, so the passing of ones and zeros. And again, at a very technical level, uh, we wanted to, to really reinforce the need for both. So when we say cyber intelligence, it can incorporate aspects of cybersecurity. It can incorporate aspects of cyber threat intelligence or whatever definitions are out there. But it can also be uh, uh, serving its own purpose. Um, kind of if you look at, uh, say, the difference between if you're, if you're doing counterintelligence work and if you're doing physical security, there's overlap, but they're two distinguishing entities. Uh, and that's, that's how we take our approach to cyber intelligence. So I think we have a relevant question here from, from Robert asking, is there a correlation between this topic and network-centric warfare? Yes and no. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good phrase that's used out there in the military and in government, and, and I think some, some private organizations have obviously picked that up as well. Um, a lot of folks that we talk to, especially who have that experience in the military, kind of say, oh, well, this is, you're just saying the same thing. You're doing the same thing that we were doing in the 90s. You're just calling it something different now. Um, and, and to an extent, that is the case. Um, the, the world of intelligence has been around for hundreds of years. It started with the Office of Naval Intelligence when our country was, was uh, first beginning. Um, and has is, is moved on since then. So uh, there are aspects of that. Again, it's really um, it's taking the technical and the strategic um, now in this kind of cyber threat Internet of Things space. So hopefully that helped. Okay, great. Very good. Yeah, Melissa, we'll go back to you. Okay, great. On. Thank you. So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about the offerings that we have for the consortium. Now, this is what we're doing for the first year. The offerings are going to look very similar for the second year, except we'll be focusing on different, uh, different topic areas. We won't be regenerating the same thing. So first we have our steering committee, and we're actually really fortunate for this first year. We have a great steering committee. They're very involved. They're very helpful in guiding us in our research. So we want to make sure that everything that we're doing is really representing our members' interests and really giving them what they'd like to see uh, out of the consortium. So they're directing our research and our prototyping efforts. Second, we have our cyber threat baseline. Now this is, um, it's going to be all anonymized data, and this is research into our members' cyber threat environments. Um, so we've developed uh, assessment factors, and we're going to be looking um, with our membership at their environments uh, to identify the common challenges and the best practices that they have. Um, along with this baseline, we'll also be developing a summary of key findings to share these common challenges, the best practices, the lessons learned uh, through our research. Next, we have our Tradecraft Labs. We have two of these the first year. Our first one we held this past November, um, and our next one will be held in May. And this is a member-only in-person workshop, and we're pulled together to uh, look at advancing cyber intelligence capabilities and showcase relevant technologies that our membership's interested in. Next, we have our implementation frameworks, and we are going to, we'll be talking about them a little later in the webinar, uh, but we have four that we are doing this first year, um, and we'll talk about those in a little while. Uh, next, we have our crisis simulation, and Jay will be going into this later in the webinar, but really this will be kind of our big event that is going to close out year one and launch us into year two for the consortium. And this is going to be a large in-person event, uh, similar to a capture the flag exercise, but we're going to have our members, analysts, come here and work on a large cyber threat scenario together. Um, we're really excited for this one. Um, finally, we have our intelligence insights, our bi-weekly emails, and our bi-monthly newsletters. So our bi-weekly emails are really just a way for us to keep in contact with our consortium members. We give them an update uh, every two weeks on the work that we're working on. We like to showcase what our members are actually working on in their respected organizations. And then we're also sharing with them conferences and workshops and interesting news items that we've run across um, you know, the previous two weeks. And then finally, our bi-monthly newsletters. Um, these are sent out, and they really just cover different topics, um, a little bit more in-depth to topics relevant to cyber intelligence. Okay, great. Thanks, Melissa. So uh, what does it look like to actually do R&D in the cyber intelligence space, at least from our perspective? We wanted to give you some insight into that. Um, Melissa talked about a lot of different offerings that we have going on here. Uh, with the consortium, and we wanted to give you a sampling of, of some of the output that we've done for our members to date. Uh, and again, since we just started in June, we're only about halfway, year, halfway through our first year, and uh, we've already put together some, some interesting <coughs> stuff. Um, so we're going to talk about two uh, in these offering demonstrations, the first being evaluating intelligence. 
we, uh, in talking to our members and talking to um, just other organizations, whether it be at conferences or, or in other interactions they have with the SEI and CMU in general, um, and we talked about this really with our definition, uh, cyber intelligence is a phrase that's often used, but it's interpreted in many different ways. Uh, when this, with all these different interpretations, you're going to get a, a ton of analytical output. Um, you could have an intelligence service provider giving you a paragraph summary on a recent threat to the banking industry. Um, you, that, that is a form of cyber intelligence. You could be getting a strategic product, uh, a yearly basis, kind of what Verizon does. Um, that can be another form of cyber intelligence. And when an organization or a person is getting this type of information, how do you evaluate that information? We saw in talking to some of our members and some of the participants in the previous projects we worked on, that uh, if they actually had the resources and the, the personnel to do this, started putting together some type of standardization when it came to evaluating these different intelligence products that they received. And we thought, well, that's great. How can we apply that to a broader, to a broader scope? How can we make that scalable? Um, and so we took those best practices, and then we looked at things that already existed um, to come up with an evaluation template that anyone can use, regardless of their size or their, their um, economic sector, uh, to evaluate intelligence. Um, we pulled a lot from uh, the U.S. intelligence community's Directive Number 203, directives that come out that try to give standards to the U.S. intelligence community for a whole host of different uh, aspects of their, of their job, um, one of those being doing standards for evaluating intelligence. So when we talk about the criteria that came with our evaluation template, really a lot of this is built off of intelligence directive number 203. Um, there, Melissa and I easily can sit down and come up with some criteria. Um, however, this has been something that's been iterated uh, with a lot smarter people over a lot more years uh, than we've put into it. So we wanted to utilize what's pre-existing out there and, and try to build off of it for our own purposes. So here's the template. Um, we put together uh, kind of a first version automated template for you for, again, thanking you for to participate and to be able to give you something as you walk away from this webinar. So in the downloads, uh, you will have a template for evaluating intelligence. Um, essentially, what you can do is you can assign a grading system to any type of piece of intelligence that you would like. Um, the grading system is A to F. You can see it's uh, a max of 17 points. And there's criteria. These five criteria do align back to the intelligence community directive um, in our hopes of getting some standardization out there um, and building off of the great work that's already been done. Uh, we can go to a little more detail on all of these, but first, uh, I think we'll take another time out for a polling question. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to give another polling question to help uh, direct the flow a little bit, folks. So that question is, do you want additional insight into the types of intelligence products produced for cyber intelligence? And while you're voting on that, uh, we got a couple questions, people asking about an archive or the slides or where these references and materials are, are available. Uh, the event is being archived, so that should be up at some point tomorrow. The login is the same as you had today. You just go to the registration page, log in with your, uh, the email that you uh, use at registration time, and you'll be able to access the archive. Um, Jay mentioned the files are in a, an actual files tab in the console. You'll see the presentation slides there. You'll see the template that Jay mentioned from everyone attending today, a, a sample of the e-newsletter, uh, the presentation slides, um, an overview of the consor consortium for government and um, industry. So hope you walk away with all those materials today. So let's take a look at our results here. And we got about 82% saying yes, they would like additional insight. So can we do a deep, deeper dive there, Jay? Sure. So intelligence products can, they really run the gambit. Um, Again, if you're doing kind of, uh, I think maybe an example will be hopefully the, the most beneficial. Um, one of the more uh, forward-leaning organizations that we've dealt with in our research, they're in the information technology space, um, and they uh, are a product-based organization, so they focus a lot of their cyber intelligence work around the products that they are developing um, throughout the life cycle, from basic research to commercial implementation, and, and they focus their cyber intelligence around that. When it comes to producing actual intelligence for their decision makers and for their stakeholders, they have a plethora of offerings. So um, they will have at a very basic uh, for, say, general employees that don't have significant technical experience um, with cyber. They have the basic uh, security awareness newsletters. So maybe it's on a bi-weekly or a bi-monthly basis. 
putting out newsletters like, you know, here's the proper passwords that you could use. Here are some things that you might have seen out in the press about, uh, say, the Sony attack or what happened at Target, what happened at Home Depot. Here's how it affects you. Here's how it affects the company. And here's what you can do moving forward. It can give some training opportunities. Uh, those are some examples of some, of some intelligence products. Um, if you're looking at more a technical range and if you're focused more in that kind of, say, cybersecurity space, um, information that, that organizations receive from the U.S. CERT um, that's talking about different threat streams, uh, the passing of indicators, those type of write-ups that are putting context to information. I think a lot of times you'll see things classified as intelligence, but if it's an Excel sheet with a thousand lines of different indicators, that's information, that's not intelligence. Once you put knowledge to that information, it becomes intelligence. Uh, and so that's really where we distinguish when we talk about intelligence products. So you can get, the, what, you know, if you're getting those daily, those da daily input from US CERT, from, from the SEI zone cert. Um, that is certainly a form of an intelligence product. And then you can get to the strategic level. So every morning the president uh, has a, a briefing, um, a presidential briefing where he s receives news on national security and a whole host of other issues. Uh, that's an intelligence product. The binder that, or, or the presentation that he's getting every day are paragraph to two paragraphs of, of national security issues from terrorism to counterintelligence to cyber. Uh, and those are all forms of intelligence products. It could also be, you know, the 60 to 70 page report that um, you'll get from organizations uh, that talk about, you know, here's, here's our deep dive into Stuxnet uh, and who we think is responsible. Um, that's a form of intelligence. Uh, so there's really a whole host of different intelligence products, um, but those are a few examples kind of going from Technical to non-technical to strategic, strategic to um, to not as strategic um, that we consider when we when we use that phrase. Okay. So. And, and another just a relevant question here came in from Joe asking: Is the consortium developing any analytical tools for its members? Yes. So the consortium does not. Um, we're not operational. We're not providing intelligence in the form of you need to take this type of approach with your network security or you need to, you know, this threat actor is bad and you should, you know, avoid them at all costs. Um, that's not the purpose of the consortium. It's to do the research and development um, that our members want and that includes analytical tools. Uh, some of the things that we're focused on when it comes to that um, is helping to beef up the evaluation of intelligence like we're currently talking about. How, um, what type of tools can be put in place to, to, to automate as much of that evaluation as possible. That is significantly helpful for organizations when um, contract renewals come up for external intelligence service providers. If it's a major organization that has uh, many different directorates or divisions, all of those play in the cyberspace in some form or fashion, so have a need for cyber intelligence. And um, that can come in handy when dealing in organizations in that, in that world as well. Terrific. We're ready to move on. Great. Okay. So, going back into evaluating cyber or yeah, evaluating cyber intelligence. We've got the five criteria. Again, it goes back to the U.S. Intelligence Community Directive number 203. Um, the first one is being objective. These are all factors that are really important to consider, not only when you're writing an intelligence product, but when you're evaluating one. So, it really can apply uh, in both instances, we're applying it for the evaluation of intelligence. You have to be objective, and the, uh, this criteria is worth four points, and there's uh, four different aspects, point each. Uh, you got to function from an unbiased perspective, so that, that information you're reading, that information you're receiving, that, that has become intelligence, um, has to be unbiased, that there's not personal biases uh, within there. Um, it gives due regard to alternative perspectives. Um, you can say X is occurring, but you need to say it could be Y, Z, M, a whole host of other alternative perspectives, but then come back to why it is that you went with X. Uh, regard to contrary reporting, um, this is very important. I'm saying something, but these five people don't agree with me. Here's why they don't agree with me, but here's why I'm still saying what I'm saying. Uh, that's important to put, to, to add credibility to an intelligence report to see the validity of it. Uh, and then acknowledge developments that necessitate adjustments to analytic judgments. Um, you're always hoping for the 100% solution. It's not really feasible, but you want to try to get as close to 100% as possible. So you have to look, is the intelligence product a living document? Um, if it's time stamped from 1980 and you're still trying to quote it in 2015, depending on the content, you might be a little out of your league and might not be as, uh, might, people might not want to believe what's in that report as much. So th that's something uh, to consider when you're evaluating an intelligence product. The next criteria, Independent of political considerations, 
Um, so there's objective assessments. It's being informed by available information. They actually have cited their sources. You can see it's not just something they, they came up with over the weekend or their own personal feelings. Um, and then it's not altered or distorted in a way that looks at a particular policy, a poli- viewpoint, political stance, or curtailing to a certain audience. Um, you, you obviously want to be aware of your stakeholders, but you don't want just to, to satisfy them even if uh, that's incorrect information. Next, timely, pretty straightforward. Is it actionable? Um, is this uh, something that is, uh, are, do you have a quick turnaround? Is that intelligence product coming to you within a day, within four hours? Is that time justifiable? Um, is that been taken into consideration? The second to last, based on all available sources, there's three parts to this one. Um, all relevant information is available, even o- utilizing open source information. For government entities, this is still really a big push. Um, people want to put a lot more stock into classified information, but you really can find almost just as good, if not better, information out there in the open source, wor- open source world. And it's important to consider that and incorporate that into an intelligence product. Uh, another big one is addressing intelligence gaps. Um, especially if you're, if you're trying to put together, say, for um, you know, a decision maker that's in charge of network security, you have to get them the 60 to 80% you know, solution in a matter of hours. Um, but you're identifying the gaps that you still need to fill so that they know this is a, a work in progress assessment. Um, and not only what are the questions that you still have, are there gaps that actually um, are identified, but how would one go about collecting, disseminating, and accessing the, uh, the information needed to fill those gaps. Uh, a, a solid kind of A-level intelligence product is going to focus on all of this information. And, and finally, the biggest criteria of them all is exhibiting proper standards of analytic tradecraft. Melissa alluded to this. Uh, analytic tradecraft we look at as an art and a science. So the art is what's going on in your brain, what's going on in that analyst's brain, what are the experiences they have that are influencing that, what's their educational background, Uh, What type of mood are they in? Is this a Monday morning or a Friday afternoon? That could significantly change the analysis that they're putting together. Um, And then it's a science. What tools are they using? Um, What uh, uh, methodologies do they they leverage to come up with this? Um, That's important to capture when you're evaluating an intelligence uh, product. can be a little trickier in getting into somebody's brain, but this can help a little bit. Um, So it's worth seven points. There's seven different aspects. What are the quality and reliability of the underlying sources? Um, you'll see this a lot. You want to make sure that if you're getting a product that's on a cyber threat, let's hope the source is, say, a, a malware analyst instead of uh, a member of the janitorial staff. Um, there's probably going to be a big difference in how they're assessing a threat, uh, and you want to make sure you have uh, the, the right type of sources in that product. You want to caveat and express your confidence in analytic judgments. So do you have a, a high confidence something's going to happen or a low confidence? And then what is your estimate of likelihood of, that, uh, of this threat occurring? Um, uh, almost certainly, uh, about 50% equal or, or very low confidence that this is going to happen because you're, just, you're, not, uh, you're very unlikely to see this event occur. Um, you want to distinguish between assumptions and judgments. Those are important. And, and it's important for whoever wrote that intelligence product to do that. Uh, the author of the intelligence product also needs to be relevant to the stakeholders. We kind of talked about this. Um, going to be different in how they're going to write that analytical assessment for a CEO compared to, say, the head of the Security Operations Center or the SOC. Uh, for the SOC, you could probably get a lot more technical. For the CEO, it's not going to have as much of an impact. That should, deter- that should impact how relevant um, that intelligence product is and then how it gets graded. Uh, using logical argumentation, consistency of analysis over time, and then making the judgments and assessments that are justified with the supporting information. You can probably see through these criteria, we talk about supporting information a lot. Uh, Very important that the intelligence product is based off of credible and reliable information. So when you put these all together, it adds up to, if if you're doing a great job, 17 points, and you can grade accordingly on down. Um, In the template that you can download, you have space to, uh, if you wanted to take any type of an example of an intelligence product and try this, um, you have fillable space that you can utilize in the PDF and then it'll put in a score and it'll automatically tally it up um, can be a starting point for, for putting together an evaluation cycle or process for uh, evaluating intelligence. And now we'll move on to the second one, which is evaluating analysts. Okay, so we'll spend a few minutes on how to actually evaluate cyber intel analysts. This really came about 
um, because no two people think the same, no two people have the same shared experiences, and no analyst produces the same uh, intelligence the way another one might. This is really tricky for organizations um, to evaluate the critical thinking and the problem solving skills of both the workforce they currently have and new hires that they're looking to bring on board as many of our organizations are right now. So the solution we're proposing to this is an evaluation template that is um, based on how analysts assess a fictitious, ill-structured, and really complex cyber threat. Uh, and it's presented through scenario-based exercises. Um, now, we're suggesting that organizations would use this to either evaluate their current analysts, and then they'll be able to uh, really see where they need some additional work. Um, and then they can also use them for, uh, as part of the hiring process, to look at interview candidates uh, and prospective new analysts and really set them through the same scenario and, and kind of see what they come up with. So the template, um, Jay will talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, but I think we have a polling question. First. Yeah, we're going to give our, our fourth and final polling question here, folks, and we would like to know, are you interested in hearing more about the competencies and skills that make a good cyber intelligence analyst? So take about 15 seconds to vote there. We'll continue to move on. We'll come back to these results here, Great. Melissa. Okay. So this template for evaluating analysts, um, you know, if you step back, it, it comes in three different parts. Um, it, and so you'll have a threat scenario, um, and you can really use any scenario. Uh, for example, you could use Stuxnet and put your analysts through, through that scenario. Um, but at a very high level view, you're looking at three different components for this holistic view of assessing a cyber threat. The first one, you're looking at the threat actor's potential to actually execute the cyber threat. Next, you're looking at the organization's impact of the cyber threat on the target, so you or your organization. Um, and finally, you're looking at the target or your organization's exposure to the cyber threat because of potential vulnerabilities uh, within your system or within your folks. Uh, so now I think Jay will walk you through kind of each one of these aspects. Jay, before we go there, just a, a quick update on the poll. We got about 79% looking for more information on the skills that make a good cyber intelligence analyst. So if we can do a deeper dive there. Sure. Sure. Uh, okay, so when we look at uh, what makes up a successful cyber intel analyst, um, and I'll point you again to the, the papers that you're able to download, um, we have a white paper on traits, core competencies, and skills of successful analysts. We worked with our members and our organizations, our previous research effort, and we really looked into what makes up a, a good cyber intel analyst. Um, and it's really, it's kind of threefold. Uh, first are the traits, and these are things that can't necessarily be taught. You can certainly have them you know, encouraged through coursework, but it's being curious, having an open mind, really wanting to dig into the details. Um, and then next you have uh, kind of technical and strategic skills. So your technical skills, you're looking at, um, you know, computer networking, malware analysis, um, you know, pen testing, red teaming, uh, things that are easily uh, easily taught in a classroom environment. And then you're looking at more strategic or more softer skills. So this is research methodologies and processes, uh, critical thinking, communication. So the ability to um, write and communicate for decision makers or for your leadership. Um, so, uh, you know, happy to talk more about this. This is a, a personal favorite of mine. Um, so I would encourage you to check out the white paper. Uh, we have a spider graph, an infographic there. And again, reach out because we're happy to talk more about this. Okay. Terrific. Let's move on. Yeah, and I think just uh, to touch on that one final, um, it really can depend to where the organization is at in their cyber intelligence um, kind of maturity. Oh, no, we don't like that word. Um, just <laughs> in how their, you know, their capability. Um, what we'll see is if you, if an organization has been around, say, say an organization from the financial services sector, been focusing on cyber intelligence for a while now, say since the mid or early 90s, um, they've got the resources, they've kind of got the people in place now that they can specifically hire for, say, a malware analyst, and all that person's going to do is focus on malware. Um, they can hire the strategic analyst, and that person's going to focus solely on strategic. What we found for a lot of organizations today is they don't have that luxury quite yet, so they need a renaissance man or a renaissance woman that is uh, a knower of all, master of none type of approach. So the person in the morning can be, can be sifting through indicators to put together a, an assessment for the, for the security operations center. And then in the afternoon, um, turn, you know, taking uh, that technical topic into a non-technical 
room of, say, the board of directors or the C-level executives or um, a senior policymaker in the government and having to talk them through, here's the cyber threat and this is how it affects your upcoming acquisition or your upcoming movement of military personnel. Um, so I think, Melissa, you know, I think we both see that, that um, it, currently a lot of organizations need that kind of renaissance man, renaissance woman when it comes to the cyber intelligence work, which is tricky. I think for the individuals that have that, that's fantastic. You're in a good spot right now because um, that is sorely needed and it's kind of a, a talent um, driven kind of marketplace right now when it comes to that aspect. Okay, but we can go, we'll, uh, we'll now go back into um, evaluating analysts. Um, and so Melissa mentioned we have a template. Um, this comes from research that we really saw. So she mentioned we have three different aspects, threat actor potential, organizational impact, and target exposure. We put together this holistic approach because when we talked to organizations, uh, what we saw was very interesting. So organizations, the couple that we saw uh, in the federal government, and again, we're not making any blanket statements like the whole you know, US federal government does this or anything, but the organizations that we interacted with um, were really focused. When we asked them, how do you prioritize threats? How do you assess a cyber threat? They focused on threat actor. And that was, that was, they had the blind, that, that was their focus, was the threat actor. When we talked to organizations and industry, um, it made more sense for them, whether it was, say, the energy sector or the healthcare sector or uh, the information uh, technology sector, was, well, we'll just focus on the impact, the organizational impact that a cyber threat would have on us. We're a product company. This is, that's what we're focused on. We're worried about our brand reputation. So we'll prioritize and assess, assess threats based off of that. Others would come and say, um, whether it was within the same sector or elsewhere, well, We'll look at our, our vulnerabilities. We know, you know the vulnerabilities caused from our employees, from our contractors, from our internet presence, and we'll assess and prioritize threats based off of that. Um, so when we looked at, okay, if we're evaluating an analyst in a perfect world, this analyst would look at a threat from all three perspectives. And so that's why we put together this holistic approach and why we're looking at it in this way. Um, we've mentioned scenarios. We have developed actual scenarios that our consortium members have access to that they can utilize for potential hiring people or for taking maybe a baseline of, of their current analytical core. Um, that will be available to the general public in the future. Um, we'll probably look at the end of spring, early summer for that release. So if you are following, continuing to follow the SEI, and at the end we have our own Emerging Technology Center Twitter, you'll know when that stuff's available. But um, we mentioned scenarios because we do have some. They're just currently available for, for our consortium members. So in looking into these three different um, kind of aspects of assessing a threat, we've got some nice spider graphs for you. The first threat actor potential um, to execute the cyber threat, we break that up into capability and intent. Uh, you want to look within capability, the attack methods and the resources. So you're seeing the potential of this threat actor or threat actors. What's their infrastructure? What is their maturity? Um, how do they you know, go after a target? Um, that can really change your approach to how you're assessing a threat. Uh, specifically for the target, is this something that they've been planning for two years or did the threat actor just create some new type of intrusion tool over the weekend and it's you know, a federal holiday and nobody's at work and so now this is a kind of a target of opportunity for them. Um, that's really going to sway how you can assess a threat. When you look at resources, pretty basic. What type of money do they have? Where's the cash flow? How does that impact uh, what they're able to do? The type of people that they have? What are the training of those folks? Do they have the Carnegie Mellon computer science background? Have they taught themselves on their own? Uh, that certainly uh, should be weighed into how you're looking at uh, the threat actor. And then when it looks at intent, motive can really tell you a lot. Um, goes into kind of these, these human factors. Um, is it just personal rewarding? Uh, does, does it give them their own internal sense of pride? Or are they being paid by an external entity to do this? Are they in need of financial resources? Uh, and then the targeted data, data, what is it? Is it organizational data? Is it personally identifiable information? Um, that's going to tell you a lot about the threat actor potential uh, as well as kind of you know, their intent. The next is the organizational impact of the cyber threat on the target. We look at the target as more an organization, but you certainly could look at it as uh, an individual person or a group, um, any, any of those type of, of entities. And we break it down into operations and strategic interests. So operations, uh, usually you can quantify when you're doing this type of uh, an assessment or an evaluation of how an analyst assessed a scenario. 
um, related to uh, kind of monetary uh, quantifiability. Um, you can look at direct costs. So what would, what would incident response uh, cost an organization in, with this cyber threat? What would the downtime look like for the business? How would that impact the bottom line? Um, and then the mitigation and prevention of, of moving forward or, or going back to, to clean something up. Um, business operations come into play as well. How will this cyber threat affect the supply chain or does it emanate from the supply chain? Uh, the logistics, uh, how is it going to impact all the different aspects of logistics for the organization? And then the future earnings, what's this going to look like for future acquisitions, for future R&D, for the bottom line? The strategic interests are, are usually not as uh, easily quantifiable with, with money and numbers, but um, certainly not, not any less important. When you look at organizational interests, uh, how does this cyber threat relate to strategic planning? A lot of private companies have one, three, and five-year strategic plans. What's the impact on that vision, and how is that going to change if this cyber threat is effective or if it's already occurred? just depends on what, at what stage of, of analysis it occurred, whether it was the activity ongoing or has it yet to happen. Um, the stakeholders involved, I mean, you're talking employees, external stakeholders, if you have a board of directors, if you have uh, stockholders, uh, that, that type of stakeholder. And then the culture. Um, culture can play a big impact as well. Is this, uh, does everybody share desks so they have a lot more opportunity to get on a computer that uh, is unlocked? Um, is there much more rigor when it comes to physical security? What is the, the culture of the organization? And then your external interests. Um, how does this cyber threat relate to the market and the industry of the organization? Geopolitical aspects of where, say, the organization has locations. Uh, partnerships, uh, are they involved with their ISAC or their information sharing and analysis centers? Um, uh, brand reputation, uh, how, will, how will this impact the brand? And then for the final, the, the third one, is the target exposure to the cyber threat because of potential vulnerabilities. And we break this down into vulnerabilities caused from people and cyber footprint. People's kind of obvious because there's always going to be a human involved. Um, what's the relevant and, and what, what is the access with regards to people? So relevance, internet presence, what's occurring when employees go home and get on social media? Are they uh, providing information they don't think would be relevant to threat actors but is, is very helpful for threat actors? Uh, extracurricular, extracurricular activities. We see this a lot with organizations, especially in the private sector. Uh, are your board of directors, you know, they're involved with your company, but they're also involved with other, other entities. Some of those entities might come under the microscope of hacktivists or nation states, and then you now indirectly uh, have a cyber threat. Um, what's your exposure because of that as it relates to certain cyber threats? Um, that's something when you're evaluating an analyst, they should be, they should be covering when they're looking at a different uh, uh, cyber scenario. Um, and then the motive. And for access, um, pretty straightforward, you know, physical access, network, their position, uh, and abnormal activities. You know, usually abnormal activities, establishing a baseline for what network administrators are doing can be time consuming, can be frustrating, but it certainly pay, can pay a lot of dividends at the end when you start identifying your abnormal activities. Uh, for cyber footprint, infrastructure, again, pretty basic. What's your hardware, your software, and your supply chain? Uh, and then your internet presence. Um, is this organization, does it have a website? Uh, if it doesn't, man, that makes things a lot easier. Um, social media, and then additional services that are available. Can you VPN in? Uh, can you telework? You know, what, what's all the different aspects uh, that that relates? So when you add these three together, you can assess how an analyst is, is looking at a cyber threat. So whether it's you're bringing in someone and you want to hire, or if you're looking at the current layout of your analytical core, um, I think a great example could be if you have, you know, 10 analysts and you kind of want to see, well, we've got to devote the resources next year for their uh, professional development. So who's, who's going to go to uh, a conference? Who's going to go get some training? Um, if you put them through a scenario and you had them do a write-up, what we propose is you take the scenario, you take the write-up that they did or the analysis that they did, you can apply it to these spider graphs so you can see where, where they're excelling and where they maybe need a little help. If all those 10 analysts um, really struggle in taking a cyber threat and applying it to the organizational impact, um, maybe they need kind of a, here's your company 101 on what we do, who we are, and, and uh, that type of information. That's going to be a telltale sign for you um, and can help you in that type of baselining and, and divvying up of resources. Okay, so enough of that. Now we'll go back to Melissa. Okay, so I'll talk a few minutes about the future work that we have coming for the consortium. Uh, first, we are working to automate the templates that you have here for evaluating intelligence and evaluating analysts. 
Um, as Jay said, right now they're always available to our members first. Um, look later at the spring, early in the summer for them to be released to the general public. Um, and we're also continuing our implementation frameworks. Remember, these are our how-to guides. Uh, we have three of them coming down the line, focusing on predictive analytics, red teaming, um, and intelligence collection management. Two of the other things that we're working on to finish up the year one of the consortium is we're producing kind of an interactive platform for learning how to build a cyber intelligence capability, whether you already have one, whether if you're trying to figure out if you need one, or whether you don't even work in this space and you're kind of uh, you're concerned or you want to you're interested in, in how it could impact what you're doing. Um, if you think about it, cyber is a very general term. It touches on pretty much every aspect of an organization, whether you work in HR or marketing or actually are a cyber intelligence analyst. Um, so cyber intelligence is important to you no matter what, um, if you look at it from that perspective. So we're trying to put together an interactive platform where all these different stakeholders can come together and learn how to build a cyber intel capability. Uh, again, whether they have one, whether they want one, or, or in a lot of cases, organizations don't have the opportunity to have a cadre of 10 to 15 cyber intelligence analysts, so they need to outsource. They're going to have intelligence service providers, and there's many options out there. This can help in kind of identifying, well, what exactly do I need? Uh, and so we're going to put that together. It's, um, we're trying to be creative with it, so we'll be a little dodgy right now, but uh, hopefully people will like it when, it when it is produced. And then our crisis simulation. So uh, you'll probably mostly hear about this as a war game, but we like to call it crisis simulation, to be politically correct. Um, this is going to be a great kind of capture the flag exercise where we're going to bring in the strategic and technical analysts and put them through a very interactive uh, crisis simulation. Um, we talked now just about evaluating analysts, and we showed you those three spider graphs, the, the three different perspective, perspectives an analyst should be taking uh, for threat actor, organizational impact, and target exposure. Our crisis simulation is built off of those spider graphs. It's built off of that model. So it's going to put analysts uh, of our consortium members through that so that they are interacting in real time with cyber scenarios and cyber threats, and they're utilizing all the different aspects of those um, a kind of threat assessment guide or model um, to make sure they're getting a holistic approach when they're going through those two days of the crisis simulation. For our members, this rule will occur at the end of June, um, and, and after that we'll see about making other versions available for the general public. But those are, that's a lot of the bigger things we've got going on for the last six months of the consortium. Um, we certainly thank you for your time and learning more about the consortium and the cyber intelligence work that we're doing. Um, this is our contact information. If you're interested in going into more detail about anything we've talked about with regards to what we're focused on in cyber intelligence, or if you are interested in consortium membership, this is my contact information and then the general SEI contact information. Feel free to reach out. Um, we mentioned a lot of things will be coming down the road for uh, the general public. Um, if you follow our Twitter account, which is at SEI underscore ETC, You'll get to know when all that stuff is available, and then you can head to the SCI website. You can also do that by following the SCI Twitter account. We try to give you as many options as we can. Um, so with that, turn it over back to Shane. Jay, Melissa, thank you for the uh, terrific presentation. Before we start our, our question and answer session, folks, I just want to remind everybody to please fill out that survey before exiting, as your feedback really helps us drive and improve these future events that may, we may do. So let's get into our questions. Uh, from Florina asking, how much do the other, this is in quotes, INTs, it's H-U-M-I-N-T, mm -hmm. G-O-I-N-T, contribute to your cyber, cyber intelligence, government versus private sector? Well, so just want to distinguish, we, you know, we're not the actual producers of intelligence, um, but we always stress, and you can see it, I hope, in, in some of our models, especially in the evaluating analyst section, all the ints should come into play. Um, when we look at a strategic cyber intelligence product, it should be uh, looking at human intelligence or human, SIGINT, which is signals intelligence, if you're thinking NSA, GEOINT, which is you know, Google Maps, uh, or what the national um, or NGA does. Um, that's your GEOINT. There's MAZINT, measure, measures, and now I'm blanking. Um, but essentially for MAZINT, um, we, we certainly promote or we talk about how can you augment your cyber intelligence collection capabilities if you just had sensors on all the towers of the computers in an organization. If that sensor gets hot on a Sunday at you know, 6 in the morning, that should 
go back to some type of a, of a, of a watch center that says, well, this, this is abnormal activity. We need to see what's going on. And if nobody's at that desk, well, now what's going on? Is somebody, has somebody already gotten in? Um, that's another form of, of an int that should be coming into play with cyber. So, you know, again, we are an R&D capability, so we're not actively producing, you know, real-time intelligence. But um, when we put together the methodologies, the processes, the tools, and the training that can help those operators uh, doing the day-to-day work, we look at it from that holistic approach of bringing in every form of intelligence or, or every int. And open source, too. That's, uh, there's always debate if open source falls in some of the others, but, you know, I'll just throw that out there as well. Okay, from Jula asking, uh, these analytic trade work standards, aren't they all based on ODNI's standards or have they been revised for cyber? So we've added to, so ODNI is, is you know, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence oversees the U.S. intelligence community. Um, they, they should be that arm that kind of, you know, gives guidance for the whole intel community. So we do have some standardization. Um, that comes from, you know, that criteria is the general criteria that comes from Intelligence Directive 203. Um, when we put, uh, whether our students uh, here at CMU, we teach graduate level uh, courses in cyber intel, or if we're interacting with our consortium members, we certainly put that cyber intelligence flavor to it. So when we're talking, um, I'm trying to think of an example. So the timely criteria for evaluating uh, intelligence, um, that needs to have, uh, when you're evaluating that piece of intelligence, timely needs to be based not on the editing function of that internal organization, but it needs to be, you know, because this is a certain, uh, you know, threat or a piece of malware, whatever it might be, um, if that intelligence products is, product isn't relating the timeliness of that, of how quickly a remediation needs to occur, and likely, you know, it probably needed to happen hours ago, um, that's where we try to bring in the different aspects of cyber. Um, so in the slides, it's probably looking a little more general, but when you're considering that evaluation criteria, yeah, it's always applying it to the cyber uh, domain. Okay, next from Robert asking, what are your thoughts about using personality trait testing? Example, Briggs Myers. Is that something you're familiar with in your work? We are familiar with that. Um, we've gone through a bunch of those ourselves uh, when we have our team offsites and all that stuff. Um, I think a lot of that... Uh, so when we first came up with the core competencies and skills, Melissa went through a session that she can talk about um, that really talked to all those 30, diff 30 different organizations we were interacting with um, about their core competencies and skills. And we certainly got a lot of comments about, oh, Al, I'm starting to think in that space of the Myers-Briggs. Um, and and I, Melissa, you can talk more about that. Sure. So many of our um, participants, when we were we were trying to gather this information, they talked about skills, uh, and as I mentioned, they talked about technical, but they also talked about um, more of the softer skills, the communication, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and the the research methodologies. And then they started talking about traits. So yes, there was a lot of talk about a lot of this. You know, whatever makes up a successful cyber intel analyst is just natural to them. They are naturally looking for more information. That's not something you might necessarily be able to teach in a classroom environment. Um, so there is a, 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 some work being done right now that's really doing behavioral testing, um, similar to, to Briggs-Myers during the interview process. And I think that there, that's a, certainly an area that we could expand and we could look into more. Um, yeah, we'd definitely be more interested in that to actually look at some personality uh, testing during the interview process and for your current analysts. And a lot of that drove mm -hmm. when we put together um, uh, evaluating analysts or when we talked, when, when Melissa mm -hmm. talked earlier about core competencies and skills was, you know, how do I, like, if I'm hiring for a malware analyst, technically I know what questions to ask them. I know, you know, if I want to see ISSP, like, I know what I'm getting with that. But if I, if I'm trying to figure out the more, I guess, softer science, if critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, how can I figure that out? And that's where, you know, that was really the impetus for us to put together, here's how you can evaluate analysts uh, and looking at it from those different perspectives, because you'll see uh, one of the scenarios is, you know, you have an hour and 20 minutes, here are five different pieces of intelligence from different ints, give us a write-up, give us an assessment of your opinion of the cyber threat. And from that, you can kind of start to see um, those kind of critical thinking and problem-solving skills. But a lot of our consortium members and a lot of our, our organizations we interact with say, yeah, you know, we've, we went and did the Myers-Briggs, or there's another one, DISC, uh, D-I-S-C. Um, 
and I know I'm introverted, I know I'm, you know, this and that, how, how does that then play into the cyber world? And, and we can get into uh, a lot of good discussions with that. For instance, we talked to a government organization that they, um, to produce a strategic intelligence product, on average it was taking them two weeks. If you think about that in the cyberspace, that's, that's way too long. You needed that in probably hours or at least, you know, maybe a day, but you're starting to push it. Um, they found that just by looking at some of this more softer science, um, they took their uh, technical analysts and their strategic analysts that were in separate facilities and put them together in a way that complemented some of the introverted and extroverted natures. Um, and that reduced that time. And it kind of is silly to think this was all you needed to do. But by having them sit next to each other, the two weeks went down to about three days. Um, so just, just an example. Okay, this question's from me, um, from Abadola asking, when can we get an encore of the materials of this lecture? So we're not done yet, and people want an encore already, so, so good job. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's being archived, so it'll, it'll be up tomorrow. You can log in the same way. As for the materials, just go to the Files tab right there, and you can walk away with everything today. Uh, from Dawn asking, what outcomes are typically revealed in cyber intelligence? Can it be unauthorized access, loss of data, tampering with data erosion, performance denial of service, or is it all of the above? Or is it so it can be all of the above. Um, I'll also mention, if Melissa wants to chime in too, um, I would say overall the biggest challenge that we see from organizations, some even saying, don't even bring it up, I don't want to go down that road, is return on investment. So um, I think that's maybe caveat, getting a little bit away from your question, but you're right, all of the above will constitute as kind of outcomes. It really depends on the stakeholder. Uh, again, the CEO is going to want to know something very different from if you're going to talk with physical security, uh, if they have, you know, if they're relevant to a cyber threat, um, but the return on investment is incredibly difficult. Um, we thought going to the financial services sector that that would be maybe the least concerning for them because they could tie it back to money, and we were wrong. Some organizations would would say, okay, yeah, every month, every two weeks, I'll show here's how much money I've saved uh, the bank because we didn't have these intrusions or these accounts weren't weren't taken uh, from us. Uh, we went to a bank down the street and they said, well, we consider that soft money, so we don't, that's not considered credible when we do our forecasting or when we have those bi-weekly C-level meetings. Um, so it's very difficult. Okay, Robert would like to know, are you aware of FBI regional outreach programs on the topic of cyber intelligence to help establish industry awareness? And if so, do you have any comments? I know there's a lot being done within the federal government, and I think we have to hand it... Uh, at least from what we've seen with ODNI, the FBI, DHS, and NSA trying to work together um, to get these type of regional developments. Um, I think obviously there's probably a long way to go and, and we're not as pleased with the progress, but I think they're doing a lot of great work. Um, there's a lot of entities out there that can be helpful. So you've got the ISACs, you've got the Information um, Sharing and Analysis Centers. Um, those go by sector, but I also know there's talk about of bringing the different doing overlap and bringing all the sectors together. Um, I know they continue to work, uh, and the FBI is great with working on, you know, trying to make the relationships between the public and the private sector. So it's not just uh, uh, they come and take and never give back. I think they're trying to work on that. Um, you have places, I mean, just here in Pittsburgh. So we've got uh, NCFTA, the National. Cyber Forensics and Training Academy um, that is a great kind of entity that can bring together these government and non-government types from across a whole bunch of different entities to share information uh, at, at a more regional uh, level. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's probably where we can end our comments because we know there's a lot of initiatives out there. It's probably not as fast as people would like, but I know they're certainly trying. Okay, great. From Phil one that wanting to know, what decision support system or DDS, DSS tools should we be feeding our threat info into for helping us to one, assess threat levels, and two, helping us quickly optimize our own decision making? Can we comment on specific tools? We'll probably have to get back to you on that one. Um, I think overall we could state that the vast majority of organizations that we talk to, they might leverage some tools, but they have the most success with making their own internally. Um, some of them will get some tools and then kind of tear it apart and make it their own. Um, so I think anything that allows customization can be helpful. Um, sorry, that's not probably as specific of an answer as you'd like, but uh, follow us on Twitter and we'll, we'll give you some feedback following that up. Um, I think that's a great question we can take to our current consortium members and see 
what, what they're currently using. Great. We've got about a minute left, so we'll wrap up the, with this one from Keith asking, is there currently a database or group of people that keep track of how companies have reacted to cyber threats that can be then accessed and used as part of actionable intelligence, this being for a company or analyst dealing with a situation? Mm-hmm. Melissa, any... Uh... Yeah, I, know, I mean, I know there are folks that are capturing that information and they're capturing the threat information. To my knowledge, I'd be happy to look into it, but to my knowledge, there's not any one thing that would be um, given out publicly and accessible that way. Yeah, I mean, I know there's, uh, it, it's a little tricky, and I think we're pausing just because as a, as a federally funded research and development center, we're not going to, you know, we can't really say this is the best place to go to or, or give that type of stamp of approval. We just, you know, that's not the space that we operate in. Um, but I know that there are opportunities out there. Um, I think if you looked in maybe more of the intelligence service provider realm, um, even just Googling intel service providers, you'll get, I think, a good listing of organizations that are offering those capabilities. Okay, folks, we are at 2.30. That's all the time we have for today. Again, thank you very much for attending today's webinar. Again, fill out that survey upon exiting, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>